What's up, everybody? Longtime listeners know that this podcast is a labor of pure love for me. So my only ask is that you help me spread the word about it. Rate, review, and share this podcast. It'll take you just a few seconds or a quick tap of the thumb, but it would mean the world to me. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein, and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. We're rewinding to Season 3, Episode 2, to chat with Ben Eifert, founder of QVR. Ben is one of my first repeat guests, and this is probably one of our more popular episodes. Instead of the usual interview format, I called this episode Bad Ideas with Ben Eifert, and basically just asked him a bunch of questions about naive option trades and whether they're a good idea or not. For anyone starting their journey with options or volatility, the whole episode really is a must-listen. The clips I chose here were selected because I thought they provided a really good cross-section of topics into the world of options while highlighting one important common thread, the risk of unintended bets. I think this is one of the most universally important concepts in trading and investing, and Ben really drives this point home here as we cover topics ranging from writing options for income to why VIX minus realized doesn't mean what you think it does. The subtle through line is the reminder that it's what we don't know we don't know that will eventually get us in trouble. I hope you enjoy. Ben, I've done a bit of analysis on a stock. It's currently trading at $70, and I am a very happy buyer at 50. I think this stock is a great steal at 50. Should I just start selling some puts down at 50 and just get paid to wait? It's a good question, and it's one that you get a lot. I mean, the answer here is maybe. This is one of the most common framings that you see for option trades from retail brokers or institutional overlay providers, the way that they pitch option trading to clients. It's like, oh, you should be willing to buy the stock at 50. Why not sell that put? So like this should be a Captain Obvious statement, but it depends on the price. You should sell an option if you're getting paid enough premium to justify the risk that you're taking when you sell the option, kind of first and foremost, not based on where you might be willing to buy a stock or something like that. So options have negatively asymmetric risk, which means you can typically make a lot more on a long option position than you can lose on the premium and vice versa. If you're short the option, you can lose a lot more than you can possibly make on the premium. And you're supposed to get paid a risk premium for that. So let's take your example, the stocks at 70 bucks, let's say the three month 50 strike puts are 25 cents. Say you sell those, terrible earnings come out, the stock barfs down to 50 bucks next month, those puts could be trading at 10 bucks, and you sold them at 25 cents. So now you've lost 40 times more money than you thought you ever could possibly make on the trade, or that it's a limited win thing when you sell that put, you can make 25 cents. So that big stock move down might not have been a likely outcome. But what was the probability of it happening versus what did you get paid on the option? That's really the key question. If there was a 10% chance of that event happening, then you sold a put for 25 cents that should have been worth at least a dollar because the $10 was the loss you took when it happened. And like in practice, you obviously don't literally know the probability. You might have a view on it. You might be tempted to say, oh, well, the market was relatively efficient. It always offers you a fair price for this. Well, but if the put was 10 cents, would you still sell it and just say, oh, that's probably fair? Like, what if it was one cent? Would you just figure that's probably fair and you'd sell it? If you want to buy the stock at 50 bucks, that's great. Put a little alert in that pings you if the stock goes down to 50 bucks and you can go buy the stock at 50 bucks. You don't need options for that. Whether or not it would make sense to sell the $50 put or just in general to trade an option, it depends on the price of that option versus the payoff that that option offers and whether that makes sense in the context of your view on the stock. Thinking this through maybe where people might struggle and I'll play the dunce here where I struggle is I read all this literature about 
harvesting the volatility risk premium. And it seems like to me when you're selling options, you're selling optionality, you are harvesting that volatility risk premium. When I look at something like realized volatility minus VIX, it seems like a great trade over the long run. So it seems like a no brainer. So what am I missing out on here? Why are these ideas not a great idea when it seems like selling vol is a great idea? The VIX example is a really good one. And this, I think, is a common thing that people don't understand. It's a little bit niche. So the VIX is an index that the SIBO publishes that everybody really focuses on reflecting short-term implied volatility. But the key thing here is the VIX is actually the market price of something called a one-month variance swap on the S&P 500. So a variance swap is a very specific thing. The payoff of a variance swap is the difference between the square of the initial volatility level traded, which is the variance, and the square of realized volatility over the next month. When we say that a variance swap is convex with respect to volatility in the same way that an option is convex with respect to spot, because as volatility rises, variance rises much faster because the square. So let's say you sold a one-month variance swap at 15 or so in mid-February of this year. Realized volatility over the next month was around 90%, which was pretty high. So 90 is about six times 15. It's tempting to think, oh, if I sold vol at 15 and then vol realized 90, I lost sort of six times my money in some sense of, well, how big was my exposure? I lost six times that. But that's wrong because this is a variant swap. You actually lost 36 times that. Your loss is proportional to the square. And that's really important. Because of that convexity, the price level of a variant swap on the S&P is always at a material premium to the the at-the-money implied ball, right? So in normal markets, it might be two or three points above. So the the at-the-money might be 12 and the VIX might be 15. In a higher volatility environment like this, that premium might be five or seven or 10 points because the volatility of volatility is very high and the value of that convexity is extremely high. So if you compare VIX to S&P realized vol and then you say, oh, well, on average, say between 2018 and 2019, the VIX was two points higher than S&P realized vol, for example, that doesn't mean that you would have made money selling volatility. So you can compare at the money implied vol to realized volatility, or you can compare VIX to realized variance or the square of the VIX to the square of realized variance. And those are apples to apples comparisons. But saying that VIX is two points higher than subsequent realized vol, that may have well been a break even or a money loser on trading at the money straddles, for example. And the huge loss in the volatile periods and the extra negative PL associated with the convexity of the variance swap means that that may have been a break even to a money loser on the selling variance swap also. So really important thing to understand, volatility risk premium historically has been very, very regime dependent. So there have been long regimes. So let's say 2009 to 2013, for example where the discount of realized volatility to initial levels implied volatility was very high on average. And you were structurally getting paid money when you were harvesting the volatility risk premium, as you said. But even before the March 2020 blow up, that premium had compressed to just about zero in terms of where was implied versus subsequent realized volatility before things got ugly in March. And then, of course, in March, the realized vol was massively higher than the next anti implied vol. The same thing was true, by the way, in the run up to the credit crisis. So volatility risk premium converged to essentially zero before the credit crisis happened and then went massively negative. And this is fairly typical in late cycle environments. You have compression of risk premium, you have people flooding in to try to sell volatility and make money until there's literally no expected return left selling volatility. And then you have an unwind and then potentially risk premium change. So I think that's really the question from here is, did the events of March 2020 change risk premium on a forward looking basis? Did it change the nature of sellers and buyers? And I think the jury's still out on that. We can talk a little bit more about that later. So let's stay on the topic of tail risk. This is one that feels like it pops up every time there's a tail risk event, which makes sense. You get a bunch of folks who come out and say, look how great tail risk hedging is. You should be doing it all the time. And then you get other folks saying, well, no, 
look how quiet you were over the last six years. You bled all that money. This doesn't actually make sense when you accumulate all the losses. And there's a lot of papers and a lot of studies out there saying that tail risk is actually overpriced. And then you've got a bunch of practitioners saying, nope, it's underpriced because you can't actually price the tails. And so the question I guess I would pose to you is, should we ever buy it? I mean, naively, I would say, well, doesn't the volatility risk premium, if we believe it's positive, doesn't it ultimately say that tail risk is overpriced? So first of all, it's very important to think clearly about what we mean by tail risk and how that's distinct from volatility just generally or long volatility. And then we'll get into a couple of other things. But buying an at-the-money straddle is a long volatility position or a long volatility trade. But I don't think that any tail manager would describe that as a long tail risk position because an at-the-money straddle has some gamma and some convexity and some exposure to volatility locally that goes away very quickly as you move away from the strike. Tail risk is really about very big events and very asymmetric payoffs in very big events, not about kind of local hedging or local volatility exposure. So when we talk to large asset owners about tail risk hedging, a couple different things. First of all, it is entirely a conversation about asset allocation and portfolio risk, not a conversation about the standalone properties of some particular strategy. So when a pension fund is thinking about their asset allocation, they're thinking about the role that every line item plays within that portfolio. And the reason that they think about tail risk hedging typically is that for a large institution, usually at some point for large enough losses in the overall portfolio, you have very disruptive characteristics for the organization that start to kick in. So you had a lot of large pension funds in 2008, for example, once they'd sustained 40% losses in their overall portfolio literally not having cash to pay benefits and to meet outflow requirements and being forced to sell equities, being forced to sell illiquid private assets and venture funds in the secondary market at five cents on the dollar. So the benefit of having a highly asymmetric strategy and overlay within the portfolio that cuts off that extreme tail risk and therefore dramatically improves potentially the long run portfolio performance by cutting off behavior that you would never want to have to engage in, like selling assets in the secondary market and 10 cents on the dollar because you have to raise cash no matter what, is the role that those kind of strategies play in a portfolio. And if the world makes any sense at all, you should, of course, expect on a standalone basis, highly asymmetric trades that are negatively correlated with bad states of the world to have a negative expected return over time. It would be crazy if they didn't on average over long periods of time, because the whole point is assets should have positive expected return if they involve taking bad state of the world risk. You get paid to own equities because equities do well in good times and lose money in bad times. And an asset that's negatively correlated with equity and particularly very negatively correlated with equity when the world is particularly bad, that should have a negative expected return, full stop. But that doesn't mean it doesn't belong in the portfolio. From a portfolio perspective, actually the long run expected returns of a portfolio that doesn't have to stop itself out and reduce its risk at the worst times can be very positively enhanced. But then the other key question is, at a point in time, how much is the world charging you for different types of tail risk? And are there opportunities for an asset owner that makes sense given the pricing? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. I think typically in the five years after the credit crisis, generally volatility and tail risk was very expensive because many asset owners flooded into tail funds and flooded into insurance buying at any price given how bad that event was and how bad the hangover of the memory of 08 was. And in that environment, in many cases, it just made sense for asset owners to take less risk to the extent that they had, they couldn't sustain a 40% loss. But then in the last four or five years, risk premia have generally been very low. A lot of tails have been very underpriced as they have brought in large sellers of tail risk to try to generate carry. And there's all kinds of examples you can get into there. But in that environment, it can make a ton of sense for people to pay a small insurance premium in order to make a lot of money in a sufficiently bad event where the rest of their portfolio is down a lot and therefore avoid the negative convexity of having to sell assets at the lows. One of the things that I 
often hear when talking to folks who use options frequently is the implied sort of cheapness or expensiveness of a given option. Looking at the implied volatility, you said it there, if you think the option implied vol is cheap or expensive, you might have one trade versus another. How are you thinking about measuring that cheapness? I think for most people who come from like an equity background, they go, okay, I can look at sort of the balance sheet of a company and it's very, I'm trying to measure the intrinsic value of something versus the price of the stock. And then you go to the options world and you go, oh, I've got this derivative that maybe you can do your derivatives math and work out and try to price it. But at the end of the day, the market's priced it at this implied vol. How do you think about trying to say, well, this implied vol is too expensive or too cheap? If you're not a absolute return volatility manager that's really focused on understanding implied volatility, one simple way to think about option prices is just in the context of the probability of different events happening. So if you have a Bloomberg terminal, it has a nice framework for doing this. You can look at, take your example of a $50 stock and this question of $70. Is that a, a, you know, maybe I want to sell the stock there. The options market tells you what the implied probability of the stock getting to 70 bucks over any time horizon is that there's options listed to. And the really simple way to think about it is what if you had a call spread that was very tight call spread right around 70 bucks like a 69.99 7001 call spread or something. That call spread is basically just a binary option that pays you a certain amount of money if the stock goes to 70 and otherwise pays you nothing. And so with that intuition, you can figure out what the option market says the probability of an event happening is. And you can forget about implied volatility and realized volatility and skew and all this stuff and you can just say, "Hey, I'm a fundamental analyst. What do I think qualitatively the chances of the stock getting to 70 bucks in six months are. And what does the option market say? And if you think based on your broader analysis that it's a sub 10% chance that the stock gets to 70 bucks in six months and the options market is telling you it's 15% or 20%, that's a reflection of, at least from your perspective, a reasonable risk premium being baked into that option. But if you think the chance is 20% and the option market's saying 5%, then that's a reflection that at least on your fundamental view about a company that the options are too cheap. How much does structural supply and demand imbalance in the market affect those probabilities though? It affects them very heavily. Really those probabilities, we like to say things like, oh, the market believes X or the market is pricing X, but the market is just a bunch of prices that come from people buying and selling stuff at certain prices. And when a large institution comes in for the month in its overwriting program and sells 20,000 upside calls in June on MGM or whatever it is, that's going to move the price down a whole bunch. And it's going to move the implied probability of that stock going up to that price down by a bunch. And nothing changed other than a transaction in the marketplace and a materialization of supply and demand. I hope you enjoyed this dive into the archives. If you did, leave us a rating or review and share with a friend. It helps us grow and it means the world. Thanks for listening.